Krakoto Katoa. Guten Tag. Hello, greetings. My name is Patrick Flam and I am a senior lecturer in international relations at Te Hirangawaka, Victoria University of Wellington in Aotearoa, New Zealand. My research interest is in environmental geopolitics, especially in the Antarctic. The main challenge for the future of Antarctica is environmental change and its ramifications for global politics. You might have heard about Thwaites Glacier recently, sometimes called Doomsday Glacier in the media. If this glacier collapses, it alone would add 65 centimeters to global sea uh, levels. The Antarctic is, is not far away. What happens there is a view into the future um, and has um, consequences for the rest of the planet. The message from Antarctica in this regard is clear. We need drastic climate justice now, urgently. We do not want the Doomsday Glacier to collapse. Climate change is a public health threat that affects vulnerable populations, especially the poor. In 2017, the International Organization for Migration highlighted that there has been little work done and attention on the impact of climate change as a risk factor on human trafficking. I urge the German government to help develop a climate risk index that could be used by UN member states to track and gauge their readiness for mitigating the risk against human trafficking. The German government can build upon the work being done by UNICEF on their Tourist Climate Risk Index. We need evidence and data, and this work will go far towards well, getting that. I train in Nunavut, Arctic Canada, with renowned polar explorers Matty McNair, who holds the world record for the fastest traverse to the North Pole, and her daughter Sarah McNair Landry, who in 07 was nominated for the National Geographic Adventure of the Year. My expedition and team and I were in Svalbard, Arctic Norway, April 2019, when the decision was taken to cancel the North Pole season for the first time in its entire history. I was so close to having embarked on my ski expedition to the North Pole and was forced to think about the consequences of our actions and how that's impacting the Arctic. It shook my world. My name is Diego Osorio. I'm an advisor on climate security and climate diplomacy. I'm based in Canada. I just wanted to say that uh, working on climate security is perhaps the most important thing that we need to engage in terms of the long term. Uh, humanity has unfortunately not used wisely the planet that is ours. And now it's taking us to a crunch point in which we're going to have to deal with the consequences of the misuse and overuse of our nature. In that context, the possibility of facing conflicts that are generated, fuel or uh, expanded because of climate situations and climate consequences is extremely high. And so we need to build on our resilience, working on climate diplomacy and ensuring that uh, our systems, our institutions are able to face the challenges and the difficulties that we will be facing because of climate security problems is, is essential. This is something that for which we don't have a second chance. And so we need to get it right at once and in a preventive manner. Canada is also working on that, and I'm very, very much looking forward to have a very productive and a very uh, multi-layered collaboration with Germany. Thank you very much, and have a great day. Herzlich willkommen zur 22. Welcome to the 22nd Foreign Policy Conference at the Heinrich Böll Foundation. I'm Giorgio Franceschini, and uh, I'm head of the Foreign and Security Policy Division at the Heinrich Böll Foundation. And I've got the pleasure and honor to accompany you through the last phase of our trip. Um, the title is on the way to carbon zero foreign policy in the age of climate policy. And as I said, this is the last um, um, episode of our series. And I'm quite happy <clears throat> that you have already joined us. As you all know, our foreign policy conference will be streamed in two languages, in German and English. And we will have 
discussions in German and English. And of course, we would like to ask all participating uh, people to select the right language channel and we allow you to have an exchange via the FNA tool or Q&A tool. Um, and there you can ask questions, which we will try to answer. And above my head, you can see the hashtag AUPO2022 for those of you who like to send out tweets or comments. What uh, will this event today be about? This final session will try to bring together two things. On the one hand, the international expectations, hopes, and also concerns surrounding the climate crisis. And on the other hand, the plans of a new federal government under participation of the Greens, with the Green Foreign uh, Ministry and the Green Climate and Economics Ministry. And we will try to find out how these hopes and um, aspirations and concerns uh, fit into what the new federal government can do in the field of climate protection and climate policy. We started with a video of people who are close to us and who tried to express their concerns, the melting of a glacier in the Antarctica and the forced migration and the conflicts that um, emerge due to climate change. And we will continue on this, um, on this direction. But before we start with our first keynote, we would like to uh, hear from you and we would like to know if the federal government has sufficiently committed itself uh, in view of the current climate crisis. And we would like to start this little survey now. I will read out the question. Will Germany uh, come up to its climate policy Responsibility, yes, a little bit. This is the second from the top, rather not the third one. And the fourth answer is no. So these are the four possible answers that you can give. And I am looking forward to the results. So it's, it's quite a mixed result. And most people voted rather not. And second is a little bit, and yes is actually the answer with the fewest um, or smallest approval. So the federal government is not coming up to its climate uh, policy responsibility. Um, and this is why it's so important and so timely that you talk about this topic today. We will start with the debate on the responsibility and also the expectations by showing you a video This is a speech by the Prime Minister of Barbados that she is given at the climate conference in Glasgow, the so-called COP26. And this was quite a moving, quite a strong speech in which she also expressed that not only Germany, but the international community of states together is doing too little in order to counter the climate crisis. And I think it would be a good start for our discussion to uh, watch the video now. And I would like to ask the technicians to start the video now. Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. The pandemic has taught us that national solutions to global problems do not work. We come to Glasgow with global ambition to save our people and to save our planet. But we now find three gaps on mitigation, climate pledges or NDCs. Without more, we will leave the world on a pathway to 2.7 degrees. And with more, we are still likely to get to two degrees. These commitments made by some are based on technologies yet to be developed, and this is at best reckless and at worst dangerous. On finance, 
We are $20 billion short of the $100 billion. And this commitment, even then, might only be met in 2023. On adaptation, adaptation finance remains only at 25%, not the 50-50 split that was promised nor needed given the warming that is already taking place on this earth. Climate finance to frontline small island developing states declined by 25% in 2019. Failure to provide the critical finance and that of loss and damage is measured, my friends, in lives and livelihoods in our communities. This is immoral and it is unjust. If Glasgow is to deliver on the promises of Paris, it must close these three gaps. So I ask to you, what must we say to our people living on the front line in the Caribbean, in Africa, in Latin America, in the Pacific, when both ambition and regrettably some of the needed faces at Glasgow are not present. What excuse should we give for the failure? Do some leaders in this world believe that they can survive and thrive on their own? Have they not learned from the pandemic? Can there be peace and prosperity if one third of the world literally prospers? and the other two-thirds of the world live under siege and face calamitous threats to our well-being? What the world needs now, my friends, is that which is within the ambit of less than 200 persons who are willing and prepared to lead. Leaders must not fail those who elect them to lead. And I say to you, there is a sword that can cut down this Gordian knot and it has been wielded before. The central banks of the wealthiest countries engaged in $25 trillion of quantitative easing in the last 13 years. $25 trillion. Of that, $9 trillion was in the last 18 months to fight the pandemic. Had we used that $25 trillion to purchase bonds, to finance the energy transition, or the transition of how we eat, or how we move ourselves in transport, we would now today be reaching that 1.5 degrees limit that is so vital to us. I say to you today in Glasgow that an annual increase in the SDRs of $500 billion a year for 20 years put in a trust to finance the transition is the real gap, Secretary General, that we need to close, not the 50 billion being proposed for adaptation. And if 500 billion sounds big to you, guess what? It is just 2% of the 25 trillion. This is the sword we need to wield. 1.5 is what we need to survive. Two degrees, yes, SG, is a death sentence for the people of Antigua and Barbuda for the people of the Maldives, for the people of Dominica and Fiji, for the people of Kenya and Mozambique, and yes, for the people of Samoa and Barbados. We do not want that dreaded death sentence. And we've come here today to say, try harder, try harder, because our people, the climate army, the world, the planet, needs our actions now not next year, not in the next decade. Thank you. This was Mia Motley's speech at the COP26. And uh, joining me now from Barbados is from the capital Bridgetown is Professor Avinash Persaud. He's the special envoy to the prime minister and an advisor on financial matters of the government of Barbados. Uh, Avinash, first of all, thank you for being with us. And um, we saw this powerful speech where the prime minister started with the sentence that the national pledges or the NDCs uh, so far are not enough. Can you elaborate a little bit 
why national pledges to meet the Paris goals uh, so far are not sufficient and where the gap lies? Sure, let me um, first thank you very much for uh, inviting us to speak to you. Uh, we think this is very important. Uh, we need to build a coalition of, uh, of powerful players to really support uh, this initiative. Let me begin by saying that um, we couldn't end the journey that we need to go on, the journey of climate mitigation, if we don't start. And Paris, the Paris Agreement of 2015, which is an agreement based around national pledges, that was probably what we needed to do to start our journey. So we commend Paris. The problem is that national pledges are not going to help us finish this journey. One of the problems of, of, of humanity, one of the, the curses of our species, is that um, we would prefer mutual self-destruction than any survival in which someone seems to be doing better than the rest of us, that someone has somehow uh, made off better, uh, made, made off in a, in a better way. Jealousy, sadly, is one of, of, of humanity's strongest emotions. We seem to prefer self-annihilation to unfairness. Uh, and the problem with national pledges is it brings to the fore all of these issues of equity, of justice. Let me give you two, uh, two examples. So we are focused, uh, the world is focused on China and India. China is the first, is the largest emitter of greenhouse gases today. India is the third largest. Um, and we're telling them that they must end coal now. They must stop their emissions. Um, and they respond that climate change is not caused by emissions today. Climate change is caused by the stock of global greenhouse gases. Because the thing about these gases, what is so poisonous about them, is that they stay up in the atmosphere, in some cases for thousands of years. And so the global warming has been caused by the stock of greenhouse gases. And who contributed most of the stock of greenhouse gases? Not China and India. Europe represented around 30%, represents 30% of the stock of greenhouse gases. America is around 20%, China's 12 India's 4 So those countries have contributed the most to greenhouse gases, who have in fact become wealthy as a result of their contribution to greenhouse, to the stock of greenhouse gases. The GDP of countries today is directly correlated with the stock of greenhouse gases they put up there in the atmosphere. Now we're going to some poor countries. Uh, uh, India's GDP per capita is uh, one fifteenth of that of Germany's. And we're saying you need to stop doing uh, what we did before. Uh, and uh, and uh, we, we are not caring about the development consequences. Um, so I think that's one of the, the reasons why Paris cannot work. Uh, and why we have been looking at an alternative solution. Now, people skirt around this idea uh, by saying that, oh, we'll find some miracle technology. Maybe it's hydrogen. That would mean that we can always do it very easily. Um, uh, or that, you know, this investment is, is going to be costless. And it may be easy to finance in Germany, but it's not for developing countries. It is estimated that if we want to stop the temperatures rising above 1.5 degrees, which is the critical, uh, the critical level to avoid these tipping points, we would need two uh, to four trillion dollars of investment every year. And we're not getting that. Paris cannot deliver that, is not delivering that. Developing countries cannot borrow that amount of money. They don't have the, the balance sheets. They don't have the national economies to, to do that. And that's why we're making our proposal. W would you like me to explain the proposal in greater detail? That, yes, it would be it would be great because they even in the speech of uh, uh, Prime Minister Motley, we heard a lot of figures that the trillions and the five hundred billions. And so I think for our viewers, it's good to to have a feeling about this the context about what is needed. And since we have a new German government, I'm just looking at uh, the first question we have in the in the Q and A. The question would even be what is the role of the German government in this 
climate finance package you are envisioning. So, but maybe you help us a little bit with, with going through the figures and on what is needed because it's, I think, a, a quite a complicated issue. So what we're saying is, is that Paris without financing, Paris just with national pledges is a bird without wings. We need a financing plan. And if you have a financing plan that really works, you actually find you don't need national pledges. And so we can actually do away with the national finger pointing. You do more, I do more. Uh, you could do away with that main obstacle. So what is the financing plan? Uh, um, I, I will say in, in, a, in a brief moment how we're going to raise this money, but let us begin by saying it is a plan is a 500 billion um, climate mitigation trust. And we would allow anybody, so not based on national pledges, to bid for this money. And they will bid on the basis of how much greenhouse gases they are reducing or removing. Clearly, it has to be independently monitored uh, continuously. Uh, and so the winners, the people who will get most access to this money, are those who will have the greatest contribution to reducing greenhouse gases or even removing greenhouse gases, something else we need to do. Um, there will clearly have to be conditions around the money, uh, uh, environmental, social, and governance conditions. We imagine that governments may bid for this money. Um, federal states may bid. Uh, states in Germany could bid for this money. NGOs that are technically competent could bid for this money. Cooperatives could bid for this money. Insurance companies, asset managers, pension funds could bid for this money. Anybody could. So what we'd end up doing is getting climate mitigation where it is the most effective, not necessarily based on who did more, who's doing least. Uh, so none of these national issues uh, uh, that are stopping us getting agreement. Where will this money come from? Well. Some people say 500 billion is too much. And, uh, and as Prime Minister Motley said, um, it sounds like a big number. We've spent 20 years cobbling together $100 billion. How can we do 500 billion a year? Well, the reality is it's not about ambition. It's about our aim. So we have already in the last 13 years uh, spent $25 trillion, the ECB, a major player in that, buying government bonds, um, in order to support our economies. And we're saying that if you spent 25 trillion buying bonds that actually finance climate mitigation, we would have had the exact same economic impact. And we'd be halfway to the goal of ending climate change. Halfway, we have wasted these last 12 to 13 years. Now, we're, we are arguing you'll get $500 billion by issuing $500 billion of special drawing rights. You may have heard the Prime Minister talk about SDRs earlier. Now, what, what is a, 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 a special drawing right? It's a slightly unusual thing. Um, uh, uh, only people with pointy heads really understand it, uh, but it is not money. SDRs are not money. They are a right. It is a right of any country Countries are given SDRs. Uh, 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 SDRs are allocated when they're issued by the International Monetary Fund according to a country's weight in the global economy. If they issue 500 billion SDRs, Germany will automatically get 5% of them, which is about 25 billion. Now, what we're saying is the SDR is a, is a right. What an SDR does when you have it, it gives you the right to go to any member of the International Monetary Fund, any country, and ask to borrow their dollars or their euros or their yen, any of the currencies that they have, at the SDR interest rate, which is currently 0.1%. It is effectively borrowing at near zero. So this is a right to borrow at near zero. And what we're saying is after you issue the 500 billion SDRs, the countries that get them, so Germany, the Federal um, Ministry of Finance will get 25 billion, that they must commit to contributing this money to the trust. The trust will take in all the S SDRs and then borrow the US dollars and the euros and the yen and the sterling, whatever else they need, to then auction off this money to people who are, have projects that will reduce greenhouse gases. The money has to be returned. These projects have to generate revenues. 
but it can be returned over a very long time when the climate change mitigation investment is beginning to work. So that is the, the essence. It, it, issuing SDRs is, is costless. Now, what, why, how can this work? How can a costless issue make a big difference? What it's really doing, it is allowing us to mobilize the world's central bank reserves. The world has 12.7 $12 trillion dollars of reserves being held for in case there's an emergency. And we're saying, well, this is an emergency. This is code red. This is a climate emergency. Now, it's not that you're spending your reserves, you're replacing your reserves with an SDR, which you could then use if you ever need it, because the SDR gives you the right to borrow at 0.1%. So, but you're releasing dollars, euros, uh, in repl by replacing it with SDRs. And so this basically gets us to mobilize for the climate emergency part, just 5%, of the $12.7 trillion of reserves people have. So look, we, we need your help. We need, your, we need Germany's help in, in three ways. Let me end with this point. We would need your help uh, from Germany's help to contribute to this plan. But we think Germany can play a bigger role. We think with the new priority being set by the new German government, Germany's leadership role, Germany has played a leadership role domestically in moving towards greater renewables. But I'm afraid to say if I can be so impolite, uh, we have been missing the German voice globally. And we believe you are now have an opportunity to be a co-leader uh, in this. We would need leadership to uh, actually persuade the IMF board, of which Germany has a big voting chunk, 5%, um, the US 17%. Um, we believe we are getting support from John Kerry, from, other, from President Macron, from other European leaders, uh, but we need to coalesce and we would like Germany to consider whether they wish to play a leadership role in getting this initiative done. Because without this side, this scale, a problem. This, this scale of initiative, we are not going to, uh, we're going to be fiddling whilst the planet burns. Uh, and uh, let me end with this one point. One of the reasons why we're not getting the change we need is that climate change is not impacting the world in the same way. There are parts of Germany that are being hurt by climate change. There are parts of Germany that are actually benefiting from climate change. The growing seasons are increasing in the northern part. Britain has become, Britain, believe it or not, has become a major exporter of wine. Believe that? Uh, so uh, wine production in the UK has increased fivefold uh, in the last 10 years because of climate change. But where I am in Barbados, climate change wiped out 226% of the GDP of Dominica in 2017. We lost 20% this year. Uh, of, of GDP from other hurricanes and other natural disasters. Um, the tragic German floods cost Germany 0.1%. These things are wiping out our countries. That is why our urgency is greater than the rest of the world and why we need your help and your support and your leadership. Thank you, Avinash. There were questions in the chat. One was about uh, the, um, the, this, the, f the financial dimension, but I think you already explained it pretty well, the SDRs, and we, of course, take advantage that you are an expert. Then there was a more uh, concrete question by, uh, by participant Isani, who just said, well, uh, we, if we want to mobilize this 500 billion, for example, what exactly do we should, should we do? Should we, he says, literally plant like crazy? Is it is like we should plant trees all over the planet? Or where do you think uh, the, the, the priority lies once we are able to mobilize sufficient amount of capital for um, uh, greenhouse gas reduction or elimination? Well, I think the beauty of this scheme is that we are not prescribing one way. And that the, 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 the auctioneer will have to look at what is the individual contribution of every project to reducing greenhouse gases, but also the portfolio, the matter of the issue of diversity, that we don't put all of our eggs in one technology, that we don't, that we spread it out. And there are a range of things we can be doing. Planting is one, but um, this, the auction method will mean that we will focus on where is the easiest, quickest way 
of reducing the largest greenhouse gases. That might be helping to fund the, the transition out of coal in China and India. But rather than they having to do it, you're now saying here's offering some money to help that transition. Um, and once you've done that, it may be planting millions and millions of trees is another way. Uh, but what this does is it incentivizes uh, our technical people to find the most effective way, both individually and collectively, uh, to reduce greenhouse gases and remove them. I think you already partially answered the question, but the same participant asked, how do you make sure that the money we raise eventually um, is really put in the right hands? Uh, you, say, you said something like an, uh, there should be an auction or a tender or um, uh, could, could you uh, so, just elaborate briefly about that? So I, I think we want to have a wide set of people. Now, I know in Germany, you probably don't understand why we need to make it wide. But in a developing country, governments do not have the ability to borrow this money. You know, we, we are, our debt to GDP ratio is 140 percent today. It is a result of the, the COVID pandemic. Um, emerging markets uh, uh, have, you know, have really been hit very, very hard. So we actually need a set of alternative people who may bid, whether it is a uh, development agencies working with us, whether it is private investors working with the government, whether it is NGOs working with, with, with the government or other people uh, or on their own. Now, there will be an eligibility criteria to bid. You would have to be technically competent. And secondly, the money will be conditional on meeting a high level of ESG, environmental, social, and government standards. And if those standards are not met, the money can be recalled. Now, because this is public money being lent at near 0%, it can have in the, in the priority, the first priority. And therefore, anything that you spend the money on can be attached to a, 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 a charge um, uh, which says that, well, you know, let, let's say you've built a, a number of, of wind turbines, but they are not hitting their social standards. Then the, the lender uh, can come and take over those wind turbines and change the ownership to make a more effective use of it. So there would have to be tough uh, standards. And if we were all lived in Norway and Germany, maybe we wouldn't need a broad set of investors. But if we want the world to make this shift, we need to have the broadest set of participants as possible. Two to four trillion dollars a year is a too large amount for governments to fund. It is not too large an amount for private savings to fund. And so we need to find a way of employing private savings. Thank you, Professor Avinash Persaud, for your time. And I think we have now very good food for thought to go to the next panel. And uh, this panel will be moderated by Noah Gordon from uh, Adelphi. I heard that some panelists are still coming in. So, um, Noah, over to you. And I hope that uh, your panelists are coming and we're looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Avinash, and uh, greetings thank to you. Barbados. Thank yeah, you. thank you, Giorgio, for the uh, kind introduction. Hello from Berlin to everyone out there today. I'm very excited about our panel today where we will discuss the domestic and international challenges of the big green transformation. We have some great expert speakers whom I'd like to introduce you to now. Unfortunately, one member of the panel won't be able to join us, uh, Dr. Dirk Messner, the president of the German Environmental Agency, got held up and sends his regrets that he can't make it. But uh, have no fear, we still have a great panel for you today. We have Dr. Sunita Narain, the Director General of the Center for Science and Environment, a public interest research and advocacy organization based in New Delhi. And we have Dr. Franziska Brandner, a Green Member of the German Bundestag from Heidelberg, Mecca, Bergstrasse, and Parliamentary State Secretary in the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy. She may be held up in a parliamentary vote right now, but she will be joining us uh, later in the session. You know, so I could spend more time uh, listing the considerable accomplishments of our panelists, but I want you, the audience, to hear from them directly. We have about 30 minutes for this panel, and we want to spend the last 15 minutes on questions from the audience. So you can submit them with the Q&A function, and please feel free to include your name and affiliation if you like. But before you join in, I have some questions of my own, um, and we'll start by focusing on the new German government with a view from abroad in Sunita. Um, 
Sunita, with regard to climate policy and climate foreign policy, what do you expect from a new German government that includes the Greens and also holds the current uh, G7 presidency? Is Sunita here with us already? I only see myself in the, uh, the Zoom spotlight. I'm not Sunita, unfortunately. Um, I don't know. Um. So Sunita isn't activating her um, video or audio, so we don't know. So she's there, but the audio isn't on. Well, of course, we, we apologize to our viewers. This are, these things happen and we had really bad luck because we had three panelists originally and none of them seems to be available. Yeah, we had a great debate planned between the panelists, but I'm sure we can find another way to, uh, to keep the discussion going. I'm just looking at my, my team here. I mean, what we could do is, um, somebody says I'm ready to jump. Uh, okay, we, we, have a, we have a participant, Kira Finke from the German Council of Foreign Relation, uh, ready to jump in. And, and Kira, we are very happy to, to uh, accept your, your um, invitation. Yeah, Kira, thanks for jumping in. Um, I have some questions ready for you. Uh, we can start by talking about the German government with a view from Berlin. Um, there are clearly high expectations of the German government's climate policy. We just heard the powerful speech at COP26 from Prime Minister Motley of Barbados about the urgency of addressing climate change. However, econ uh, Economy and Climate Minister Robert Habeck has said that Germany is starting with a dramatic backlog and will probably miss its climate targets for 2022. So how is the new government going to achieve its climate goals and what role can foreign policy play? Thank you, Noah. I think we're just bridging the time uh, for uh, Sunita Narayan to, to jump in. I have joined. I no? have joined, Noah. No, there was some problem with the connection, but I have re-logged in. Can you hear me now? I can hear you very well, and uh, thanks for joining. We'll have Kira answer this one question, and then I have a lot of good stuff for you. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Noah, and great, great to have this discussion with all of you here. Yeah, clearly we are at a critical moment in time because there were so many delays in um, offering climate uh, protection in the past decades and uh, there were some very strong points being made in the last two speeches. I think we, um, we will have to focus our efforts and uh, also um, try to kind of connect climate protection um, to other foreign policy topics. So I think especially in the G7, it has been announced that um, we will have more ambitious uh, climate topics in there. Um, but I think it's also important, besides the new ideas of climate partnerships, climate clubs, which I think um, are very valuable, we, it remains to be seen how they will be designed, um, how they can drive ambition. Um, besides that, I think it's, um, it's important to also stay accountable to old goals, such as, for example, the abolishment of fossil fuel subsidies. But I, um, I will join you on the panel later and I leave the, the space um, to our original panelists here. That sounds good. Thank you, Kira. Yeah, as you said, uh, the first priority of Germany's G7 agenda was to protect a sustainable planet and climate clubs were a big focus there. Um, Sunita, so back to you on, on the question from your expectations from outside. What do you expect of this new German government that includes the Greens and has the German G7 presidency? So I expect that the German government will um, walk um, the talk, in fact, run the talk. But most importantly, I expect that the German government will take on the leadership, uh, which means that it will not want to deny the issue of equity and climate justice, but would want to work with it. And meaning when it means that it wants to work with it, it really would like to think about how do we move ahead in such an inequitable situation how do we build trust between the developed and developing countries? How do we make sure that the financial transfer happens at the scale that it needs to happen? And how do we not lose more time in smart, uh, smart words which mean nothing, whether it is net zero or plans that don't add up, NDCs, but that we actually recognize the fact that 
climate change is, a cl is um, an existential issue. It is an emergency. Developing countries are not denying the problem of climate change, but they need very clearly uh, if, uh, to come on board in a way in which it will work for their development, but also for planetary health. And that I think that maturity is critical. And I don't see that right now, Noah. So let me, you know, when I say this, it sounds like, but well, this is kindergarten. I mean, what are you telling us? Of course, the German government will do this. And I just want to say, I don't see this. I see whether what happened at the COP where you had lectures from the head of the European Union to, you know, to countries like India saying, you know, oh, what are you doing? Well, you know, you, you children need to grow up and talk about climate change and phase out your coal. And here is EU still 20% using coal. Here is EU still with huge footprint and uh, the use of the carbon budget. And here is the world telling a country like India when in 2030, the carbon budget will be over and whether it's the past polluters or whether it is the new polluter of China would have completely taken up, gobbled up, finished the carbon budget with nothing left for countries like India or the entire continent of Africa. So let's get real about this. Let's understand the seriousness of it and let's stop playing kindergarten games. That would be my uh, request from the German government. Uh, well said, uh, strongly said. You used the word equity, which I want to come back to, Sunita. But first, you kind of led me into my next question, because one of the big arguments at COP26 was over the language in the Glasgow Climate Pact. Would countries agree to phase out coal or rather really to phase down coal? In the, in the end, they agreed on phase down. India had pushed for this softer language, feeling that advocates of phase out underestimated the extent to which India and China and other countries still relied on coal and the electricity sector in the short term. So are there other aspects of the Indian government's position on climate diplomacy, perhaps on climate finance or loss, uh, loss and damage that you feel the rest of the world and Germany misunderstand? Well, I think, you know, frankly, I'm not in favor of the Indian government stepping in to say phase down, um, not phase out. I definitely think we need to phase out coal and we need to phase it out, keeping in mind equity and keeping in mind the disproportionate use of coal in the past and even today by countries. Let's be very clear, India and China are not on the same page when it comes to use of coal. So let's start dehyphenating India from China. And that's really my problem with my government, that we have to dehyphenate ourselves from China. China today is a huge, huge, even if I look at the historical present and future emissions of China, by 2030, China would be equating the use of the carbon budget as much as US and Europe. So it's very important for us to start looking at this. Now, as far as the use of coal in a country like India is concerned, there is no doubt. We are overly dependent on coal today. 80% of our energy production, electricity production comes from coal. It has a, it has a massive impact on the forests of India, on the, um, on the people who live in the forest, it also has a local pollution impact. But it's also a fact that we need cheaper energy and we need affordable energy to meet the needs of very large numbers of people. So the question for India today is, and in fact, our plan going forward, the Indian government plan, if it is put in, as it is being put into place would mean a virtual freeze on the coal and that by 2030, you are going to see as the prime minister said, 50% uh, of the electricity production from renewable, which means a massive ramping up of renewable energy, but it'll come at a cost. And I'm worried that that cost of energy may in fact add to the energy inequity in our country. India is a poor country. People cannot even afford the cheapest energy today. And let's not, let's, let's, you know, get all this noise of solar and renewable understood that it is still too, in, uh, too expensive for countries like India. Because even if the unit price is as low as coal, the fact is you produce much less energy from renewable sources as compared to coal. So the cost per unit goes up. 
And that really is something that- uh, Wrong channel. Doing. Sorry. Sunita, can you repeat please in the English channel? Uh, sorry, what do you need me to do? Um, I need to get to the English channel. Is that better? Noah? Yeah, you can okay. translate it. Yes, that's Okay, correct. great. Noah? So yeah, that's, I, that's fine. I, Go completed, ahead. I completed that. Do you want me to repeat it or is that is that okay? That, that's okay for now. I think I think you got your point across. You also, that was a good point about differentiation and not lumping together China and India. I was guilty of it myself in that question. Um, another one for you, Sunita, before we go to the audience. Um, you, you mentioned the word equity. What do countries like Germany owe to, to countries like India or countries that have contributed less to historical emissions? And what do you think of the Barbados proposal for our $500 billion uh, climate fund that would increase the special drawing rights of developing countries? I think it's a, I mean, I, I, I heard the Barbados proposal right now, and I think every such proposal is definitely very welcome. Uh, to me, the issue of finance is going to be critical going forward, and we will need very smart ways to be able to move. Now, if you look at UNFCC, we have something called the market instrument on the table at UNFCC at the, um, um, in, in the Glasgow talks. Um, now, you know, for me, the market instrument could be a very interesting way of being able to drive this transformation in the world. But only if we decide that the market instrument is going to be designed based on public policy and not on the principles of the market. The fact is that we had something called the CDM, Clean Development Mechanism, which became a convoluted, corrupt development mechanism, simply because the intention of CDM was to look for the cheapest emission reduction possibilities in the world. The fact is we need transformation today, and that will come at a cost. So if you could actually come up with a market instrument which says that we are going to look for solutions which are transformational, put a price, a floor price on the, on the cost that will get invested. So any project say below $50 per ton of carbon reduced uh, abated will not get considered. You could, you could use such an instrument to actually push for, uh, for large scale changes in the world. I mean, I'll give you a simple example coming from India. The fact is very large numbers of women still in India cook on cooking uh, fuel, uh, which is dirty energy, um, biomass. It's bad for their health. It's very bad for the environment, local environment, adds to air pollution, which is also part of the coal problem that we have, that we have to be able to deal with coal for our own interests because of air pollution. Now, if you were looking for a solution, you could actually look at taking say the German example of your energy vending, uh, you could look at decentralized uh, mini grids across the country, which would supply electricity to households. But if you look at the economics of it, mini grids or smaller decentralized systems are far more expensive than centralized systems. And that's logical because of the scale you feed it you feed in grid uh, solar energy to the grid and then you supply it. Now, if, if you could make sure that that additional cost between the cost of what uh, would people can afford and the cost of uh, generation could be supplied through an international instrument, you could actually think about um, uh, reaching affordable energy, clean energy to large numbers of households in the world who would otherwise take the fossil fuel route. And Noah, I just want to say that when, I, when you talk about coal, I find it ironical that the world talks about coal and fossil fuel, but doesn't talk about gas, okay? So we that, need to talk about the bundle of fossil fuels, okay? Because otherwise you're talking about coal because it's used by the poor and gas because it's used by the rich today. And you've made that half step to, um, to a cleaner energy, you essentially are saying we're okay, but you're dirty. That doesn't work either. So much to cover there, Sunita. Gas is also linked to the equity issue of uh, 
European countries perhaps and building their own gas at home, but not financing it abroad. And I thought it was interesting what you said about biomass cooking stoves. It sort of gets to this the thin line between climate and environmental issues. You know, that's a problem because it air pollution and because of contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. And this thin line is something Germany has been dealing with recently as it reassigns climate responsibilities between the economics, environment, and, and climate ministry. Um, I do want to take us to audience questions and, in fact, uh, ask our superstar substitute, Kira, here. We have one uh, linked to climate security. The question is, how do we address the challenge of war as a consequence of climate issues? If you want to take that on. Yeah, thanks. And I'd also be happy to, to respond to a little bit to what was previously we said, because Please. I think it deserves a response as well. Um, so on the climate security questions, I think there are um, already some initial initiatives out there that are starting to address um, the interconnectedness between climate impacts on agricultural livelihoods. Um, you talked about uh, the poorest of the poor who are kind of on the front line of it. Um, and also um, how this can gen generate conflicts of interests, which then translate into potentially violent conflicts if there are no mediating factors. So. Um, I think one is really to invest in, um, in in the poorest of the poor and stabilize their livelihoods. So investing into agricultural livelihoods, um, investing into uh, alternative income sources. Um, so kind of classical development policy in a sense. And then also, as, as was rightly mentioned, um, the access to renewable energy needs to be strengthened um, to, to these groups. And um, on the conflict prevention side, we need to invest in environmental peace building. We need to uh, increase capacities on this, uh, link the, both the peace building um, to um, climate impact science and increase the understanding of, this, uh, of these interactions overall. And um, um, on, I wanted to mention one more issue, which I think wasn't sufficiently addressed. And I think it's also in one of the questions here in the chat. Um, is to look at also inequalities within countries, because we see deep inequalities within the European Union. We know that most of the emissions within the European Union come from uh, a small percentage of, uh, of the wealthiest uh, part of the European Union um, uh, inhabitants. And the same is, of course, true for India. I mean, you said it's a poor country. At the same time, it's, it's a rich country. I mean, it's, uh, um, there, there are these parts of, uh, of wealth within India which are not uh, equally distributed. So I think to look at the emissions of, of this part of India is also important. So I think it's, it's um, you deservedly said that it's, uh, it's an inequality between countries, but I think also to pay attention to um, the interconnectedness of the global upper and middle class and how their lifestyles are so similar and how we need to reduce the lifestyle consumptions of these people. I think it's also, um, also important to address it. Thank you. Yeah, it's good you pick up on that. There are many types of climate justice, whether between countries or uh, between generations, even between regions within countries. Uh, Francisca Brentner is with us now, so I'd like to bring her into the conversation if we could. There she is. Hi, Francisca. Yes, hi. Good to see you. Uh, you as well. Um, I have a question for you about European sovereignty. Oh, I think she's still there. Yes, I'm here. I don't know why this computer is not working well. I hope it works. Well, we can hear you okay. So um, one of the new government's main political strategies is to strengthen European sovereignty. What does European sovereignty look like with regard to the ecological transformation and could European sovereignty be detrimental to broader international cooperation? Let's start that this doesn't really work here. I hope you can hear me well. We can hear you. Okay. So, you know, European strategic sovereignty is about um, making sure that we do have enough capacity to act so that we can follow our objectives and our values. Um, that's the one slide. It's to gain capacity of action. Um, and the second one, which is important to us as well, is to become more resilient, which means less vulnerable uh, when we talk about uh, chains of production, chains of delivery, et cetera. Um, we have seen this during Corona crisis, but we see this in other areas as well. Um, and all of this doesn't mean that we want to disentangle from the rest of the world, that we want to disengage, um, but it is uh, about becoming less vulnerable in an interdependent world. So it is not about uh, you know, becoming autonomous or independent. It is about 
having more capacity to act and being less vulnerable, that's the strategic sovereignty that we're talking about. Thanks, Francisco. I want to bring in another audience question uh, directed at you now. You may have heard this one before. Can we still reach the Paris goals? Are national pledges enough or what are the options? Yes, I, you know, I, I, I hope we can and I'm doing every day whatever I can so that we can achieve them. Um, and it is sure that we do have um, as Europeans, many tools in our hands, but that in the end, it's a global project uh, to become CO2 neutral. Um, and that I think we as Germans, we have a really German and European challenge, but we also have the international one. And I hope that we can form and build many alliances across the globe, be it on mobility, on energy, on transformation of our industries. Um, on new technologies, efficiency. Um, uh, and I think, you know, it doesn't really only depend on us, but uh, we can hopefully contribute to it uh, quite substantially during the next couple of years. It won't be easy, um, but we will, you know, do our utmost. I hope we can get there as well. Um, Sunita, do you have a response to anything you've heard from, from Pierre or Francisca? I mean, we've touched on everything from uh, European sovereignty to climate security and links to war and so on? No, I think um, I, I'm not much. I think it's important for every country to push. I think what Kira said, if I could just respond to that, um, I think it's important, Kira, that all, I mean, I'm very clear that India has to act uh, on climate change and we need to act in our own interests. And we need to do it within what I would call a co-benefit strategy because if we need to deal with coal, we need to deal with it because of our air pollution problems. We need to deal with it because we need energy security and energy access for large numbers of people. And we need to do it so that it is clean energy as well. So, you know, I think, you know, there is no doubt in my mind that we need to act and we will, we, we must put together um, a cogent uh, plan to be able to do so. But let's, let's keep in mind that when we deal with international negotiations, that we are discussing them as sovereign nations. And then when we discuss them as sovereign nations, we need to understand the issue of equity and justice. And my only concern is that what I saw in Glasgow again was that every time it comes to the issue of equity and justice, there is a great effort to somehow find a new way to be able to um, to, to demean it, to cast, to, to be able to, uh, uh, to victimize the victims. I mean, at the end of the day, the world has made huge mistakes when it comes to climate change. I mean, if we, if we didn't have the Paris Accord and we had gone about it to say that every country will take on emission reduction targets based on their contributions, which was the original plan which came out of the UNFCC and the Kyoto Protocol and the discussions in Berlin that happened in the mid nineties, we wouldn't be in the situation today. We would essentially have found a way in which every country uh, uh, would have to apply to certain limits based on their contribution. So if China today has a major contribution, it would fall into the same formula or say India tomorrow with its contribution increasing would have to limit and would have to take on a target. But the entire approach of NDCs, which I believe the Europeans caved in because they needed the Americans on board um, and uh, has been an approach in which you're saying, do as much as you can and it'll all get ratcheted up and aggregated and somewhere we will lead lead to that magic number. And it's grossly inequitable. It's grossly unjust. And the world is nowhere close to meeting the kind of reductions that we need to go towards. And I think that's really the hard truth of it. And it's time we woke up to it. There's certainly a big challenge ahead. So timekeeping note, we have four more minutes. Francisca, you wanted to respond in one minute to that? No, I just wanted to say, um... That you know, I agree that it's not helpful to say this country or this one 
um, is responsible or, you know, in terms of we have a historic responsibility that is huge. Um, and I think, you know, we have to owe it and also that we have more financial capacity now to work on it. Um, and I think that's, Anita, you know, what you also uh, said that um, we're still, the, you know, among the richest countries. Uh, so it's not just in the past, but it's today that we have more capacity to invest in technologies. Um, and to spread them and I think that uh, you know this is a it's a responsibility but it's also a chance um, and I must say that it also allows us I've been you know uh, working on foreign policy for many years and I see now how um, you know how we can also change our foreign policy if we can become less dependent on fossil energy um, and I, I say every day that it will not just make it cheaper our energy in Germany but it will create more security and safety for us um, and for our you know region and I think that um, uh, this is true for many dimensions um, and that's why I'm, I'm also not uh, in favor I do oppose nuclear being a CO2 free you know in terms of uh, a climate technology because it is not a peaceful instrument and I hope that we can combine these agendas and bring it really together um, and that this would also be something um, that we could bring to the table and I hope during the G7 presidency, et cetera, that we can link up the issues um, and, and therefore reinforce also different communities which are not so often communicating to each other. I'm like, it's increasing, um, but I think then, you know, we could also be more powerful. So we've got two more minutes and two audience questions. So I'll ask you to keep the answer short. First one to Sunita, what could Germany do to help India reach net zero 1.5? Maybe you can focus more on bilateral relations because we talked a bit about the broader uh, uh, multilateral talks before. Well, I think, you know, there are, there are huge areas where we could work together. And I think uh, renewable energy is clearly an area where um, um, India is committed to renewable energy. There is no question about it. I believe the, the Indian strategy will also have to work towards not just grid-based renewable energy, but also decentralized renewable energy. And that's where Germany has incredible experience. We need to learn, we need to work together. We need to find ways in which we can make sure that renewable energy is in the hands of the poorest in my country, because it is really about energy access more than just energy. Um, there is the whole issue of urbanization. I mean, we have big advantages in our country because we have not yet urbanized, we have not yet motorized. Um, and yet, and we have a major driver for change, which is air pollution in our cities, which is actually leading to uh, government policy uh, being changed, not because of climate change, but because people now today know that they have horrendous uh, public health impacts because of air pollution. And that's where the whole question about reinventing mobility comes in. That's where the question about looking at how can you move people and not cars comes in. And that's where I think, you know, the, Noah, the biggest question for me always is that, you know, countries like India have an, all countries have an aspiration and they, the, the, the whole thing is we have to get richer and as we get richer, we need more cars. We need to find ways in which we can have the same conversation as equals and understand that actually we will be much smarter if we can build our cities without cars. And that's where I think even when I look at the transport and emission strategy, even in Europe, there isn't enough focus on moving without cars. There's too much focus on battery cars and you know all the rest of it. But we don't seem to get the scale of the transformation that we need. And, so, and so if you could wrap it up so we can get to the last question. Sorry, sorry, no. no that's okay. No, it's very good stuff. I wish we could <laughs> go longer. Francisca, very quick final question, and it's not a cheerful one. Uh, it makes me think of climate doomism. Is it not too late for Jane? <laughs> you know, um, this is uh, leads me to. Uh, one of my uh, most favorite quotes uh, is by um, Václav Havel when he said, you know, um, hope is uh, not a definition of knowing that something will end well, but the knowledge that everything we do 
has a lot of makes sense and is meaningful and is in the right direction. Um, it's not the exact wording, but more or less. And that's what guides me that I know that it's the right thing to fight for climate protection and the transformation of our societies. I, you know, will it be enough early enough? I can't tell you. I can't just tell you that it's worthwhile fighting for. Um, and that's how I see it. I love the spirit and the optimism. So let's end on a positive note. Thanks so much to all the panelists and organizers. And I'll now hand it back to Giorgio for the next session. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Vielen Dank, Noah. Wir machen jetzt in Deutsch weiter. Und das Erste ist, ich möchte mich bei euch allen erstmal bedanken. Thank you, Noah. And let me thank you very much for your flexibility. Half an hour ago, I almost died because we had planned the meeting. We have wonderful schedules with all the minute details. And then all of a sudden, there are no panelists. So you might have realized it was a bit chaotic, but Thank you, Noah, for your flexibility. And thank you, Ms. Finke, for having jumped in at short notice. I hope you all enjoyed this exciting debate. Now, this is about to end. And I would like to ask two questions. And then we will have a final discussion with Ellen Überscher. So, Please, everybody, move over to the German language channel. And before Ellen asks the questions to the panelists, I would like to ask two questions to the audience, because we are about to have a summary. So please have a look at the first question. This is about climate foreign policy. It may be also a question of the definition. So what is the most important instrument of the climate foreign policy? We have some possible answers. International agreements, for example, Paris Agreement, the carbon dioxide trade, bilateral energy partnerships or climate partnerships, multilateral climate alliances, the technology and knowledge transfer, or the extensively debated international climate funding. So what is, from your point of view, the most important instrument of a climate foreign policy? So please um, give us your vote. And I'm looking forward to the results. OK, so the international climate funding actually uh, comes in first, and this is also a major topic, very important, of course, followed by multilateral climate alliances. And uh, we also heard the term climate clubs in the debate, and um, least votes got the energy partnerships or climate partnerships. They prepared another question. And at the beginning, we weren't quite sure whether some might not be annoyed, but we'll still pose the question. It's the classic question in terms of um, departments. Um, when we started to work on climate policy at the Heinrich Böhr Foundation, we realized that it's a topic that many people would like to get involved in. And now we would also like to ask about the ministry, which ministry should determine the climate foreign policy, the chancellery, the foreign ministry, the economics and climate ministry, the environmental ministry, or the development ministry. Who should actually uh, lay out the guidelines? And I can well imagine that uh, staff of the different ministries uh, are a little bit annoyed at this question, but it's also a very interesting question. And of course, we are also very curious. So this is why we decided that we would like to ask you the question. OK, the foreign ministry actually came in first. And Corinna Fischer has already uh, 
very enthusiastic about it, uh, who works for the Foreign Office, followed by the Environmental Ministry and the Economics Ministry and the Chancellery, who are on the same uh, level, more or less. Oh, OK. At least we um, got a first overview. And now I'd like to pass the floor to Ellen Uber chair for the final discussion and for us some kind of a summary uh, on the three different events and what we've learned about climate foreign policy. Ellen, I'm looking forward to the final discussion with Agnieszka Brugger and Kira Finke. Well, thank you very much, dear Giorgio, and uh, thank and welcome Agnieszka Brugger. And also from my side, thank you, Kira, that you spontaneously uh, agreed to join the panel, but as the head <clears throat> of uh, one of the most, um, uh, as the head of the climate section of one of the most important Berlin think tanks, uh, of course, you, uh, it's easy for you to do that. Um, Agnieszka Boga is the deputy chair of the parliamentary group in Berlin, and she is responsible for the section human rights and um, I think the discussion was quite interesting. When people think that climate funding is the most important thing, then actually the finance ministry should also play a role here, but this was not the case in the survey. So we are about to take a look at the overall picture. And I know that both of you have thought a lot about this uh, topic. Um, about coherence, well, we had taken a look at the transatlantic dimension and we also discussed the issue of China last time and this time we um, discussed very intensively uh, and, and heard a lot from the global south which was very impressive and now we would like to bring all this together and say well here's the foreign policy security uh, uh, group community and here we have the people who have negotiated in Glasgow at the COP etc and this expertise basically has to be brought together. So the two communities have to come together. We need an implementation of the climate question in our foreign policy um, right from the outset. So my first question directed to you is, um, and maybe you can inc incorporate the results of the two little surveys. So how do you define, even though this is quite a complex question, uh, the question of foreign uh, climate policy and what are the risks and chances uh, from your point of view for s such a complex issue, climate on the one hand and foreign and security policy on the other hand. So first of all, I would like to hear your definition, Agnieszka. Well, I think looking back to the past years, unfortunately, we very often have thought in these so-called silos. And the new coalition agreement is trying to change this now. The, the ministries and also the people leading these ministries shall change So when I take a look at the survey, three relevant ministries uh, are led by people from the Green parties who can cooperate very well but also the Ministry for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development is headed by the former minister. And I see a lot of approaches for cooperation and coherence, which is not only confined to foreign climate policy, including climate policy, but um, people are really trying to sit down at a table, starting with the national questions until uh, security questions, which becomes quite uh, clear when we think of the current situation um, in terms of gas and Russia and um, all climate partnerships with the global south. So we have this overarching um, um, structure here. And we have a clear commitment in the coalition agreement um, in this regard. And what we've also seen in particular in this uh, very difficult and dramatic situation that we see on our current uh, continent currently in terms of our secu security policy, Annalena Bermo uh, went to Kiev and to Moscow. And in both 
capitals. She did not only talk about the crises, but also link this to the energy question and the cooperation, the question of sovereignty and possible sanctions. So this dimension is or has been neglected over the past years. So apart from the question of climate crisis and the maintenance of our um, livelihood, uh, fossil fuels usually make us dependent on the bad guys in this world. And this is why they have a clear um, security policy impact. So these were a lot of um, uh, um, buzzwords, so to speak, but I'd like to finish here. And uh, I think we need more cooperation, more initiatives and more funding. Well, the whole topic of conflict and climate um, could be discussed with Kira as well, because she's focused a lot on that uh, in her work. But one question to you, uh, follow-up question to you, Agnieszka. You said the bad guys are actually determining the agendas. So crises are being provoked um, by the Kremlin, and now the whole world has to focus on the crisis instead of uh, dealing with the most pressing issues uh, in terms of climate, um, climate protection. However, the same at the same time, the question is how open is Kiev, for example, for climate partnerships and uh, change in the energy sector, which is urgently needed in Ukraine, where they actually faced with the gun at their head. So how about the real politics, real political situation? So is it realistic to say, well, OK, we will make headway in terms of climate uh, or climate foreign policy, even though the security political issues uh, are quite classical in kind. Well, I think we do not have another choice, but it's not going to be easy. I don't want to conceal this. Of course, we cannot imagine now, I mean, or the discussion rather is at the moment, if there is an invasion, what of course we would like to prevent with all means, um, but uh, Nord Stream too, which is uh, disastrous in terms of climate policy, but this could also be part of uh, a sanctions mechanism. But um, taking a global perspective, I think we cannot afford, in view of the uh, climate crisis, to solve all other conflicts first and then to focus on the climate crisis. I think we have to do both things in parallel. We have to tackle the security policy issues and um, on the African continent, for example, we have different uh, crises there. We also have to um, answer the question, what are we going to tackle first? And I think Lavrov, when Annalena Bergwok was there, he said, well, or described how a world could look like uh, with the potential of cooperation in the energy sector. But oh, Annalena Baerbock said this, but still she was quite strict about her stance um, in the current situation and that these um, problems have to be solved or have to get solved first. Kira Finke, climate uh, crisis consequences and climate safety. How can we assess the uh, interplay between um, consequences of conflict and the climate crisis. So what possibilities do we have also to prevent or, or, or how can we react preemptively to conflicts that arise due to a climate crisis? What are the instruments that are available and what early warning systems do we have? Are there any possibilities apart from the uh, current uh, very intricate situation with Ukraine and, and Russia, for example, the Zahel region, and also um, there are also other vulnerable regions throughout the world. So what are the possibilities where we can act in a timely manner? Well, what we see right now is that um, we already faced with um, severe consequences when it um, when we 
reach 1.2 degrees Celsius uh, of global warming. And of course, it has different effects on different uh, societies and um, in different countries because the context is completely different. But we, here, this means we have to find different uh, solutions. And of course, we, mm, this sometimes leads to um, uh, conflicts of interest. Well, on the first level, we want to prevent the experience of the consequences of climate change, which means adaptation. So preemptively, we would like to mitigate the consequences. And on the second level, when climate change has already um, come about, then, of course, we have to uh, provide funding in order to adapt. But then, of course, the conflicts can also arise. We have seen it in different contexts. There might be migration within the country. So... Um, internal um, migration, and then there's more competition, for example, in urban regions, and food prices might um, grow up, and this might lead to conflicts, especially in systems that are governed in an authoritarian way. This might simply be the um, last um, contributing factor to a crisis. So what can we do? First of all, we have to make sure that we lower our emissions. I mean, this is very important, I think. And Sunita Narayan has also talked about it. First of all, we have to um, look at our country. We have to reduce our emissions, and we aren't as fast as we should be. And in view of our historic responsibility and also of our economic power, I mean, we could more quickly reduce our emissions if we wanted to. And I think here we have to do much more. And then the adaptation fund in order to um, facilitate adaptation. Earlier we heard 100 billion that were pledged but not paid out at one of the previous COPs. And in 2021, um, we have missed these targets and large part of this funding only goes to emissions reductions in um, developing countries. So there's only few money available for the adaptation um, to the climate crisis. And at the last COP, for example, Germany is also trying to try to change it. But um, we simply need more funding in order to achieve uh, an equitable situation. You might think 100 billion is a lot of money, but when you spread it across all the developing countries and for example, for the Ahrtal catastrophe, uh, 30 billion were made available overnight. So the 100, 100 billion doesn't seem to be that um, much. So the question is, what do we want to do? We want to avoid crisis because we as an industrialized nation also want to make sure that we can export our products to other countries. Then, of course, we also have to make sure that we provide more funding for climate mitigation, for the adaptation, also to our partners. Um, and for example, the US also needs to do it, for example. Uh, Agnieszka, the topic that Kira has just uh, brought up, uh, the issue of prevention and um, climate consequences and the fighting against uh, conflict are um, actually closely connected here. Uh, during the first uh, phase of the Green government, um, there was um, already a, I mean, you could already see it start, but what would you say? I mean, and let's start with Europe. What would you say? Where do you see approaches that the whole topic is put onto a different level? So maybe Europe also needs a person like John Kerry in order to have a voice for coherence, for example, and for all in all these topics. So um, from your point of view, and keeping in mind the political objectives, what is going to um, develop or how is it going to play out over the next two to four years? Hopefully a lot. I think that from the climate crisis to the pandemic, we see how important preemptive measures are and how we could spare us a lot of um, uh, expenditure when we are more forward looking. And for example, the G7 presidency of, uh, of the Foreign Office also um, strives for that because it, it includes this preemptive character and it also um, 
shows that the cooperation is very important in terms this should be reflected in terms of the staff, but also the content. And I think this is quite an interesting and, and a very important um, idea, but we have to build broad alliances in order to strengthen the preemptive character. And another priority, for example, is the foreign climate or the climate foreign policy. And this is why um, it's quite fitting what the Foreign Office um, has on the agenda for the next month. And of course, this will not end with the G7 presidency of Germany, but uh, these approaches will have to be made more sustainable together with the international partners in order to um, uh, address the worst uh, consequences and, uh, and maybe also to prevent the worst consequences. So what kind of role could the um, German missions abroad play? For example, uh, uh, Wink made the proposal that there might be a pool of experts, for example, who can provide advice. And this would be, a, I mean, then we would be less dependent on market-based instruments. Of course, this is an approach that we can um, discuss in long uh, detail. But we also might have, for example, someone responsible for uh, climate, um, like for other topics as well. So maybe from both of you, what would you like to see? How can we um, build up the expertise here? Well, may maybe very briefly. First of all, we need more staff. So many embassies, many missions have it in their portfolio, but they have one person for climate, energy, and uh, economics, or maybe even another topic. So um, this is not sufficient. In particular in countries that are most severely affected by climate change, we would need more staff and also a kind of counseling structure on which to fall back in case it's needed. Well, the situation is quite different. Uh, there are missions who are doing excellent work, but there are also missions where the topic is not of um, the biggest importance. So this is why I'm quite happy that the responsibilities in international climate policy in the Foreign Office could be abundant and focused. This is very important. So now the topic has a bigger political weight and um, this has already started. So the question now is how can we um, strengthen these topics in on the ground in our partner countries and this is very important i think it's uh, not sufficient to just agree on a nice uh, text on a nice wording but we also have to make sure that we make headway and um, the topic needs to be part of a portfolio and we do not or should not have a separate dialogue for example great i mean we uh, have run out of time but i still have the impression that we could discuss concrete instruments at the end, which the uh, virtual audience uh, could also pick up and, and spread. So this is why I would like to cordially thank you for this short and concise uh, round. And I would like to pass the floor back to Georgia. Thank you very much, Ellen. Thank you very much, uh, Agnieszka and Kira. And it is now my pleasure to thank all of you. This was the 22nd Foreign Policy Conference of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. And I hope that uh, despite some technical glitches today, you had an interesting session and we still have a little survey in our chat where you can tell us what you liked or what we could improve next time. Um, for us, it was a little bit stressful today. I like to be quite frank here because um, we wanted to do uh, a lot but not everything worked out well but I really want to thank uh, Kira, Noah, Agnieszka and all those who were very flexible and um, and uh, made these 90 minutes so interesting and so fruitful. I'd also like to thank the audience, thank you for your patience, for your participation and I would like to close this event now. Thank you very much also to the organizing office at the Hernie Böll Foundation and the technical support, Philippe and Gabriel from the company Isimco, who supported us quite nicely. Thank you very much to the interpreting team. And thank you very much to my colleagues here at the Heinrich Böll Foundation who supported um, us here. Um, 
with their work and for this event. And also thanks a lot to the cooperation partner, the Global Diplomacy Lab. I'm sitting in a small room here with my team. And now I would like to ask the team to turn on the cameras so that you can see who organized this um, conference together with me, Milena Grunewald from Foreign and Security Policy of the Hannibal Foundation, and I cooperate with her on a daily basis, Romina Riakashi and Corinna Fischer from Global Diplomacy Lab, our cooperation partner, and you were always here, and uh, uh, your support was so great during uh, this event series, so thanks to you as well, and I wish you a nice evening. This was the 22nd Foreign Policy Conference, and I hope to see you again next year in presence at uh, the Hannibal Foundation headquarters. Um, until then, bye-bye.